Tak. Dr. Lakshmi Chandra Shekhar is an acclaimed translator and well-known cinema artist who also acted in many TV serials. By profession, she is a retired professor in English. She has translated many books from Kannada into English and also from English into Kannada. Her translations won many state and national level, level awards. Her books in English are published by many prestigious publishers as well. Earlier, Dr. Lakshmi Chandrasekhar translated Dr. Chandrasekhar Kamba's novel Singarava and Aramane, which is uh, into English Singarava and Paris. Recently, she also translated his celebrated novel Shikara Surya into English. As you all know, the basic imagery and story frame of Dr. Kambar springs from the frame of Karnataka folk tradition and gets new shape with the modern sensibility of Dr. Kambar. Dr. Lakshmi Chandrasekhar today speaks on challenges of translating the works from folk background with special reference to Dr. Chandrasekhar Kambar's Shikara Surya. Namaskara. The topic of my talk today is the challenges of translating a folk novel with special reference to Dr. Chandrasekhar Kambara's Shikara Surya. Now, first of all, I must thank Dr. Kambara for trusting me with the translation of his magnum opus, Shikara Surya. I would also like to thank Mr. Vijay Shankar and Suresh of Shabdana for giving me this opportunity to revisit the novel after almost four years, I think, and relive the thrill and the frustration of not finding the right words, the sense of inadequacy when one had to make compromises. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to go through, to relive all that again. Now let's see what Shikara Surya is about. Shikara Surya is the story of confrontation between two cultures, two opposite sets of values represented by two geographical regions, Kanakapuri and Shivapura. Kanakapuri, a city of gold, seems to embody all the features of the modern capitalistic world. Ruthless ambition, cutthroat competition, insatiable hunger for gold and power, expansion, militarism, progress, technology, and justification of every kind of inhumanity and betrayal. Shivapura, on the other hand, represents a totally different set of values. To put it in Jay Surya's words, what do you have here? Huts and houses lying like sleepy cattle chewing their cud, people happy and contented, engaged in some work or the other, children racing with animals, none had ambition or great hunger or yearning for the impossible. No curiosity about other people, no adventurous made, no adventurous minds. Their faith in God was enormous. That God too could be unjust was an idea that never crossed their minds, nor entered their heads from outside. This being the case, what problems could they have? Where would problems come from? Now, Jay Surya is actually speaking very contemptuously of Shivapura, but you can see what a, a beautiful idyllic world this is. Now, the novel is narrated by different kinds of narrators. There are several narrative voices in the novel. According to the preface, 
the story is narrated by the historians of kanakapuri for whom history document documents what things were like how they came about how incidents led to other incidents and what significant changes they brought about history is the narration of incidents as they occurred now contrasting their version of history with that of helavas of shivapura they say helavas remember incidents by turning them into stories they narrate them over and over again and transmit them orally from generation to generation they bring gods humans ghosts devils and even animals into these stories mixing myths superstition and imagination with actual events now uh, they dismiss this version of history but later they admit that even these folk historians have some truth in their narration now uh, before giving us an account of what shikara surya was up to during his disappearance uh, these so called historians say sukra as we mentioned earlier is our only source from whom we can learn about shikara surya's adventures during his disappearance and he is a sort of narrator who says you may believe it or not or once upon a time there was an eagle headed giant since these days scholars are of the opinion that there is history even in folklore we are going to place it before you in our words Uh, so this is also an authentic voice then we have the jokthis the wandering storytellers now they narrate a number of short stories on their way to shivapura so in between these we have kambara himself sneaking in with bits of description or philosophy so now the interesting thing is this joke this end all their stories with this prayer to shiva let us end our story here in shiva's name and in hara's name offering our salutations to shivalinga from here now what's interesting is the novel supposedly narrated by the historians ends with the same prayer and contains in its body all the features associated with helavas narratives so then who are the real narrators of the story is this entire novel a folklore a folk story a folk fiction narrated by the helavas now actually kambara's narrative is closer to that of the helavas uh, his stories are uh, revolve around shivapura the imaginary place he creates uh, shivapura keeps changing and growing from story to story just like the uh, narratives of the helavas as dr shiv prakash put said it can absorb all times and places including the upheavals of the present even of this moment now this lends a kind of universality to kambara's works but at the same time his narrative is so culture specific that it is a challenge to any translator particularly one translating it into a non indian language now unlike a number of kannada writers who were uh western educated studied english literature many of them were even professors of english kambara is steeped deeply rooted in the culture of his region not that he hasn't read the western readers and west western novelists see uh, you can see the uh, great influence of tolstoy and lorca in his narratives but they get so integrated with his narration with his uh, plays they get uh, they fit into shivapura so well that you don't even realize that these are influences of lorca or uh, tolstoy um his narrative is packed with the folk elements he grew up with customs and traditions gods and goddesses 
rites and rituals, beliefs and superstitions, songs and stories, myths and legends, idioms, proverbs and riddles and speech patterns, which are very specific to his region. Now, most of these elements are so culture specific that it's impossible to express them in another language. Now, since translation is basically about language, uh, let us start with the language used by multiple narrators. We have the historians of Kanakapuri who narrate the whole story, Jyoktis who narrate the short stories and the Helavas, and of course, Kambara, uh, who inserts these very poetic kind of passages now and then. Now, the Kannada used by all of them is a dialect used in the northern parts of Karnataka, particularly in the bordering region of Belgaum. Uh, Kambara hails from there. And this region, the language is very heavily influenced by Marathi. Uh, you have in the narrative Marathi words like Shivai or Huvenave, which you would never uh, hear in standard Kannada. Uh, now this, uh, this gives a, a peculiar charm to the language, this Marathi tilt. But the translator cannot really communicate this variation of the language. Now, a linguistic uh, feature that all of them share is the way they count time or numbers, counting of numbers. Uh, uh, Shivapura is a region which consists of one less than 40 hamlets. They don't say 39. It's always one less than 40. And Shikara Surya, when he becomes an emperor, he rules over one less than 20 kingdoms. When the Jyotis narrate their story for number 28, they say three sevens and a seven. They don't say 28. Now, there's another very beautiful term which occurs, I think, practically in almost for all folk stories. It's as common as once upon a time. Now, that number is Chappan Aivattaru. Now, the interesting thing is Chappan is the Hindi word for 56. Aivattaru is the Kannada word for 56. So, you are basically saying 56, 56, twice. Now, what does the translator do? See, I, it would make, make no sense to say 56 twice in English. Uh, this is the number of countries the ancient world had, by the way. Uh, so this charming, magical word is lost in translation. Uh, one just can't help it. And the dialects used by the different characters in the story. We have one dialect used by Belli in a simple folk of Shivapura like Belli or Chettiga and a more refined version of the same dialect used by Shivapada, Ninnadi or Kurumuni and of course the language used by uh, Shikara Surya and the royalty in Kanakapuri. Now that is very different. Uh, when Shikar Surya hears Belli speaks for the first time, he's fascinated by the uh, the rawness of her speech. Now here, you know, he she is uh, he has just been rescued by Belli and Jatiga after he has fallen into the chasm. Now Belli uh, laughs at him for uh, being so stupid as to not to see a chasm, but then she admits that. Uh, the forest can be pretty deceptive. Now here is what she says. That's how the forest is. She loves the sight of strangers. She beckons them, tempting them with a various variety of greens, wriggles herself this way and that to release fragrant wind. Should you approach her thinking, oh Shiva, what a fragrant flower. She drags you down to the underworld. She is very cunning, this forest. Now, the 
literal translation of the word belly uses that the original kannada word belly uses for releasing fragrant wind is uh, the word uh, you know which means fart farting now she you know that so it shows that she has no inhibition about uh, mentioning a bodily function like farting in front of a strange man now this is of course the way her culture is they have no such uh, uh, you know false inhibitions but for me farting is associated with foul smell so how can you fart fragrant wind and so i use the word release fragrant wind um, but then you know it uh, uh, loses that rawness of belly speech it's uh, so difficult to capture that kind of a, a rawness and also the fact that she is speaking the uh, speaking about the forest uh, as a woman you know and now that is another feature of uh, shivapura these people live in such close harmony with nature that uh, they talk about uh, animals and plants as though they were human beings now when belly speaks to a snake she uh, speaks to it as if it were a man but later when jaisurya asks her who she was speaking to she says oh it was a worm now you know in uh, many parts of the country people don't call the snake by uh, it, that name uh, somehow they are afraid even to mention the word snake so she says it's a worm now you know so the choice of these words is not arbitrary it is part of a tradition it reflects the culture they uh, they you know they grew up in but the problem a translator faces is that you cannot use different dialects of dialects of english to represent these different dialects used by the people Now, every language every dialect reflects the values the culture the social practices of the community which produced the language so if you bring in cockney or yorkshire uh, you know dialect of english or the working class dialect of english uh, and you know substitute it for this uh, that would bring a whole cultural burden with it you you simply can't do it all those associations all those connotations that you know each of these uh, dialects have now they are peculiar to the people uh, the region uh, which produced it so the uh, indian translator translating into english is left only with the standard version of english which the educated middle class people are familiar with um and uh, one has to communicate all the nuances all the different dialects uh, with just this uh, standard english uh, by playing with the syntax or with the words you know uh, with the nature of sentences etc uh, now i'm reminded here of uh, one of the uh, one of my own efforts to you know the disasters the disastrous efforts i should say of trying to translate uh, two women characters you know, for my solo play uh, just a woman now uh, one is sakawa from devanur mahadeva's uh, famous uh, short novella odalala uh, and the other nagatte from tp kailasam's uh, play tollugatti now uh, when i now these two women come from totally different uh, socio economic backgrounds uh, sakawa is a, a poor dalit woman coming from a very rustic kind of a background and nagatte uh, is a middle class brahmin widow uh, the they two the the two of them speak totally different kinds of kannada but when i translated them they sounded so alike that i had to drop one of them now both of them came through as nagging loud mouthed old women now this is the danger 
this is the problem a translator has you know in communicating the uh, different uh, dialects uh, registers used by people of different classes different uh, you know castes etc in india uh, the biggest problem while translating the biggest challenge while translating uh, a folk narrative like shikara surya is retaining the local flavor of the language uh, the lyrical quality the spoken rhythm uh, in a kambara being a major playwright as well uses a lot of drama a number of dramatic incidents and dialogue in his narrative dialogue particularly has to sound to sound authentic must retain the local flavor uh so i have um, i have had to retain some of the original structures even when they were long winded awkward and cumbersome uh in order to retain that local flavor uh, and uh, avoid the temptation of breaking them up into simple standard english structures which would uh, make for easy reading uh you know a translator has to uh, persuade the reader uh, uh, you know from another uh, culture uh, to uh, come out to venture out of uh, his or her comfort zone and appreciate the nuances of another language another culture now this is achieved by retaining uh structures of the uh, original novel and uh, words from the source language you see there are many words uh, which uh, do not have uh, an equivalent in english because these objects or these customs uh, these rituals are unique to the culture which produced them now what does one do in such a, a context you see then you have to retain the original word and probably gloss it give some kind of a footnote or an explanation of what uh, they are about uh, but there is also the danger of over ethnification now if you use these uh, so you know words from the source language too often and the reader has to turn to the glossary every you know second word uh then uh, it becomes very cumbersome see the it affects uh, the readability of the novel so the translator has to carefully balance this urge to communicate the authenticity local flavor of the novel with the danger of losing the reader's interest so that's why they say a translation is like tight rope walking so to achieve this the translator has to use different kinds of techniques different depending on uh, uh, different contexts so i'm going to give you some specific instances of how i met these challenges now uh, first of all the names of the characters now every name in the novel is symbolic it captures the very essence of the characters who bear that name shikara surya see take the name shikara surya shikara is peak and surya is the sun now uh, it represents shikara surya's ambition to be at the top to reach the peak he is not satisfied with uh, anything less than that and then the solar values you know his arrogance uh, violence uh, his uh, uh, soaring ambition now all these are summed up in that name itself and shiva pada on the other hand shiva's foot the shiva's feet uh, the incarnation of shiva on earth uh, or he is a devotee of shiva uh, he represents shiva uh, now these two names do you know there are occasions uh, we have in the novel where these can be translated um, but there are so many other names like belly belly is pure as silver jetiga is uh, you know his with his wrestler like body and uh, gauri is named after uh, shiva's concert 
consult. Uh, Ninnadi, Ninnadi is again uh, uh, Shiva's feet, the future Shivapada, and therefore his wife is uh, Gauri, you know, Shiva's consort. And then we have names like Artha Kaushala. See, Artha is both meaning and money. Kaushala is shrewd or, you know, skillful. Uh, Artha Kaushala is very careful with both money and words. Uh, his counterpart, Dhanapala, on the other hand, is, uh, you know, not so clever. He can guard his money, Dhana Pala, he's a guardian of his money, that's all. Uh, he can't be a very successful negotiator like uh, Artha Kaushala. Now, what do you do with these names? You can't really explain the meaning of each name or build the meaning into the text as we sometimes do or gloss each name. Uh, so one has to just uh, make a compromise, you know, uh, lose the symbolic significance of many of these names. Now, the other uh, interesting uh, name is uh, uh, Kanakapuri itself. Now, the earlier name of Kanakapuri is Bangarada Hatti, which is a Kannada term for the village of gold. When it's a smaller uh, town or a village, it's called Bangarada Hatti. Later, when it becomes a city and becomes the capital of the kingdom, it becomes Kanakapuri, a Sanskritized version of its earlier name. Now, of course, one can gloss both these names and record the change, but this process of Sanskritization, you know, which Kambara is hinting at, which has happened all over the country over the centuries, uh, you know, how do you point out the irony in the change? Yeah, you know, there is no room for that. Uh, then we come to the names of uh, objects and uh, uh, places. Does one translate them? If you translate all the names, then it loses the local flavor. But sometimes, some of these objects uh, can add to the reader's understanding of the culture. Now, the best example for this is Holebande. The word uh, Holebande, now, see, river Ghataprabha, which flows through Shivapura, uh, creates a waterfall. Now, at the head of the waterfall is a huge rock, which is called Holebande. Uh, here's the explanation. During the rains, the water flows down the mountain with great force, bringing with it all the soil it has eroded. Since the muddy water coming down from the rock turns the whole stream red, people say the stream is menstruating. So people do not work for three days during this time. You see, the passage speaks so much about the relationship between the people and nature. A river, they see her as a woman, also menstruates. So she has her monthly periods. Now, uh, there are certain rituals associated with these monthly periods. The women are not allowed to uh, mix with others or carry on their daily chores uh, during these three days. They are treated almost like untouchables. So by naming, you know, by translating that uh, Hole Bande into menstrual rock, I'm trying to uh, communicate, you know, give uh, the reader an idea, draw the reader's attention to the cultural practice associated with the uh, uh, menstruation, you know, the monthly periods. Now, there are many times when one doesn't find the English equivalent for a, a certain word. See, uh, very opening of the novel, uh, when we have uh, Chinnamutta, he is still Chinnamutta, Shikara Surya's first name is Chinnamutta. Now, Chinnamutta opens his eyes and he finds himself in a mantapa. Now, how does one translate the word mantapa? Mantapa is a certain kind of structure. Uh, it is 
used as a community center here. It's a village hall. Uh, they have their meetings there. They have the dances there. It's also a museum where you have all the interesting objects, the skins of animals, the drums, etc., hanging there. And it's also the place where visitors to the village are entertained. Now, in English, you have the word community center, but it doesn't have the same connotations of uh, this mantapa. Uh, so I had to retain the word mantapa and a uh, gloss it. Now, in that mantapa, Jay Surya sees the a number of drums, dudi, dolo, you know, madale, doldu. These, each of these drums is of a different size, made of a different skin, produces a different sound and used for a different purpose. But then if I name each of these, uh, you know, retain the uh, original name of each of these and gloss each of them, that would be uh, too many ethnic words. You know, the reader might get tired of uh, reading the footnotes all the time. And is it necessary? Now, the translator always has to balance the need for doing it with the danger of doing it. So here, it was enough to generalize and say a variety of drums, big and small. Now, this kind of generalizations have to be resorted to uh, quite often uh, during the translation. Now, there are a number of uh, names of places which I have not uh, bothered to translate. I didn't think it was necessary, but there were a couple of names which uh, were very crucial, like the Valley of Vultures, Haddina Kolla, you know, which uh, plays a Pretty, a major role in the novel and the Eagle Mountain you see uh, that is another place which has a very important uh, you know a lot of importance in the novel now that brings me to these two words vulture and eagle in the region Kambara comes from the word Haddu stands for both these but the Two birds, although they belong to the same family, they have very different connotations. We see the vulture as a bird of prey, uh, whereas eagle is a, a symbol of soaring ambition and being Lord Vishnu's vehicle, it also has some, uh, you know, sanctity to it. Uh, so uh, this is a problem. One of the problems I had was every time Kambara uses the word haddu, I have to stop and think. Now, what are the connotations of this word in this particular context? And so sometimes I would translate it as vulture, sometimes as eagle, depending on the, the context. Now, items of clothing, jewelry, food are usually very culture specific. Uh, now, here is a, a description of uh, how Shikar uh, Surya uh, dresses up when he is invited to uh, the Kanakpuri Palace for uh, dinner. I will read the Kannada version first. Bandi kattaya sarapali anchina madi dotra utta gini bareda talavastra sutti selenulu hoddu ore sarapali haki konda. Now, there are specific details here about the make and print of the uh, clothes that he wears. Now, the literal translation of these details would mean, again, a long glossary, a lot of footnotes, which are quite unnecessary. Now, as it is, an English translation of a Kannada novel is at least 100 pages longer than the original. And if you try to build in these meanings, it gets even longer unnecessarily longer. So again, I had to opt for uh, generalization and say, he wore a nice clean dhoti with a narrow border and wrapped a printed cloth around his head. Throwing a shawl over his shoulders, he fastened it with a, a chain. Uh, uh, there are other references here to the way Belly wears her sari. You see, like, for example, belly, the women have saris wrapped around uh, from breast to ankle, and necks covered with strings of black beads. Now, this 
you know would require the knowledge of how a sari is generally worn and the top garment a blouse that's worn with a sari and the fact that this tribal woman is wearing a sari without a blouse and you know that uh, the bare shoulders are covered with strings and dhoti see the, there are so many different ways of wearing a dhoti a formal wear or a casual wear now all this of course uh, a bit of it may be mentioned in the glossary but a lot of it has to be left to the imagination of the reader uh, uh, items of jewelry see now here is a list of uh, jewels that uh, gauri uh, a little girl uh, you know receives from her biligiri kin atti kai kundala kantakke parijata male kai ge murgi bale kali ge huri gejje sontakke patti now approximation is another technique one has to use while uh, translating uh, this kind of a thing so i said biligiri folks had sent muddu gauri a pair of large very sized eardrops a flowery necklace twisted bracelet for hands jingles for her ankles and a, a waistband now the other uh, uh, very important gesture which is representative of a culture is the salutation different kinds of salutations you know they throw a lot of light on the cultural practices of people uh, the way people uh, bow shows the degree of their respect towards the recipient now jettiga for example offers his salutations to shiva pada by folding his hands over his head and falling you know prostrating before him but uh, jay surya who is less respectful towards shiva pada just bows you see and uh, the tribals of biligiri when they uh, salute offer their salutations i don't use the word salute because salute again carries this military kind of a, a connotation so i say salutations um, now they offer their salutations by bending down until their bottoms are up in the air and pat the ground twice with their palms now these you know are uh, the the sentiment behind these may be the same as a deep courtesy or a, a bow etc but you can't really substitute those expressions here because the the whole beauty of this gesture you know it's so culture specific is lost if you do that now there are also lots of plants and you know trees which because in shiv particularly in the section which deals with shivapura uh, they live so close to the nature there are a number of plants and trees mentioned now uh, things like kulugala gonjala kari uh, we may not find equivalents in english now, even if we search uh you can find botanical names of course but using botanical names in a um, you know in a infection would uh, sound so uh, bizarre so out of place so uh, in most places i have retained the original names and italicized them uh proverbs are another challenge to the translator see proverbs are very succinct very pithy clever expressions of centuries of wisdom gathered by a, a community uh, expanding a proverb is it goes against the very purpose of a proverb you know it ruins the the beauty of the proverb but then uh, when you're translating a bit of expansion is necessary uh, you see look, look at this proverb uh which describes artha kaushala in just two words sula gitti gu sigadavan sula gitti is the midwife a sigadavan who is uh, one who can't be caught by a sula gitti you know that uh, he so slippery that he would have escaped the clutches escaped the clutches of a midwife when he was born now you know sula gitti gu sigadavan is just two words alliterative words and to communicate that meaning i have to use at least 10 words uh you know at least with these 10 words i may be able to communicate the sense 
of the proverb but there are other proverbs where you can't even do that now look at this one uppina vanu atta anta tengin kai navanu atre now because a salt seller cried why should a coconut seller cry now people will laugh if a coconut seller cries because a salt seller cry now here you have to know the economic significance of these two uh, you know objects like a salt is poor you know cheap and the salt seller can't make too much money and it's a very perishable thing a rain comes and a whole bag of salt is gone so he might be crying over his loss whereas a coconut seller is dealing with more solid stuff and it's also a luxury item so it fetches him more money he is better off than the salt seller so a small calamity is cannot really touch him so you know Uh, there is a whole lot of meaning uh, which uh, takes the knowledge of these uh, objects you know views of these objects for granted so it's very difficult to communicate all that by translating the proverb literally uh, there is one more which i would like to mention this is a proverb nagarjuna uses when he sees how eager shikara surya is to learn uh, how to turn grain into gold now there is danger in that he tries to warn him and that's when he uses this proverb he says kottava kodangi iskondava irbatra and just four words the fellow who gives is stupid he is an idiot the fellow who receives is the smart one in this case it's the reverse because the one who receives that uh, secret of turning grain into gold is going to be the idiot but the word irbatra you know which is a corrupt form of veerabhadra uh, who is a very powerful deity particularly with the uh, the folklorists now you know without knowing the background this will not really make much sense and how does one explain all that and uh, the fact that veerabhadra has become irabhadra and that alliterates with iskonda iskonda va irabhadra kotta va kodangi now the alliteration of course is completely lost when you translate the the lyrical beauty of the uh, the original uh, you know it's it's very hard it's very challenging to capture even an iota of that now we come to this very important item which is food food is very culture specific you know the way food is cooked the kind of dishes people make the ingredients they use are specific to each geographical region and to each culture uh, anything indian is uh, referred to as a curry now in the west but there is nothing like a pan indian curry there are hundreds of different kinds of preparations each of them has a different name um, you know with vegetables we make you know, palya there is paladya there is saru there is esaru there is huli there is kotu there is gojju now how does one communicate the difference how does one uh, even you know uh, use all these words and gloss all these words now there is one context where vidyulata is uh, serving shikara surya very elaborate meal now let me read that uh, passage then she would spread out a banana leaf clean it by sprinkling water on it and serve pearly white rice 30 different vegetables cooked with pepper 15 more cooked with buttermilk and another 16 curries with coconut in them she would then serve lemon and sour berry pickle and pour green gravy over the mound of rice the feast would end with a serving of sweet payasa now you know uh this passage at least i could manage to translate it because most of the dishes were described and not named the names would have been impossible to translate but later we have another uh, short passage where she massages shikara surya with different kinds of oil nettige neyenne kivige keelenne bittu bennige bisi enne yedege tampenne paadakke hani enne hachi ugurige uri enne poosi now the only thing i could do here was to generalize and say she would massage different parts of his body his head back chest feet and nails with different oils at different temperatures 
very dull prosaic translation of a very alliterative miracle poetic kind of passage but then it's really impossible you know to uh, explain what each of those oils is about and you know uh, or you know it's just not possible to bring the beauty of that original passage into the translation now this happens very often particularly where you have very alliterative kind of passages for example when the jyotis are uh, uh, you know narrating their stories there is a reference to the underworld and now atala vitala patala rasatala such a, a lovely alliterative you know uh, kind of a thing but all i can say is deep bottomless underworld you know <laughs> nothing like the original and it's the even the unique lyrical manner in which the jyotis narrate their stories and their very unique style of narration and the narration when you mix style of narration itself is very difficult to uh, you know very challenging to translate uh, so i have uh, on the whole, i have retained uh, a lot of uh, kannada words Uh, and gloss them i have given an extensive glossary at the end of it i have used generalizations approximations and try to uh, play with syntax uh, you know uh, to try and retain a bit of the local flavor so with all these efforts and techniques that have gone into the translation one can only hope that the reader gets at least a, a short glimpse of the beauty of the narrative and a faint idea of the culture that has produced it thank you we are very proud to have dr lakshmi chandrashekar as our main speaker today in sahitya academy and in the form of translation center shabdana on behalf of shabdana and uh, sahitya central sahitya academy I welcome all of you to the program of Dr. Lakshmi Chandrasekhar.